Hello to everyone. Uh, welcome to the first of our new Dime series events. We thought we change a bit the formal format of our events to bring you the interesting evidence about innovative interventions and open up a debate and hopefully a controversial debate to operationalize these results into a different way of doing development practice. Beha behavioral change and social norms is what we are going to talk about today, and especially the use of entertainment media to transform completely the way we can do business in uh, developing countries. So we are going to, st we have a long-standing collaboration, we have a distinguished panel and a long-standing collaboration between research and the entertainment industries, and we will bring you some little snapshot of the type of work that we have been doing with uh, representatives here from uh, different media houses that will be featured in the next uh, little clip. And then we'll have uh, Victor Orozco, who's been uh, collaborating uh, from the research side in bringing out the amazing results. I think we'll have some very good news uh, to be put on the table today uh, to share with you, but also to kind of stimulate your thinking of how much more we can do. So this is an amazing time for us. Uh, one of Victor's co-authors just won the Nobel Prize in economics for the use of randomized controlled trials uh, towards poverty reduction. We are super excited about that. Uh, as they accepted the Nobel Prize, they said this is a Nobel Prize for a whole movement of people kind of applying science to, the, to public policy and understanding how we can do so much better in uh, development practice. So, so without further ado, uh, I'll, we'll open up with a clip and we'll ask you to be active participants in this debate and kind of we'll ask you to vote at the end whether you're for or against the use of entertainment media to change social norms and behaviors in the countries we're working with. Thank you. Why he keeps on calling? <laughs> Obviously because he wants more of what you gave him last night. Am I at risk? What are you talking about? HIV. Say she saw you at the stage, you're mocking off a very gisty car. Oh, that was my uncle. <laughs> Come on, dance with me. I hope to see you again. It's not the same, baby. So do you need to talk? We need to get tested. What? Can you tell me how many sexual partners you've had? My friend and I, we just wanted to find out about family planning. Safe sex, actually. Who wants to be having the sex? You want to be having sex? <laughs> Wait till this one. I don't roll like that, babe. Kito, very well now. Why is it empty? I took it off. Are you ready for a kid? Because now I can't handle the one I have already. I'm done, yo. Ibeleng. What if we are both HIV positive? We will go to the clinic to get the help that we need. Last night, he was in a no kind of mood. No need to be ashamed. Going on to PrEP will protect you against the HIV. I'm HIV positive. You need to get tested. Yes, sir. I'm going to put you on IRVs immediately. I have a friend who's living with HIV, and she's living her best life. It's not the end of the world, yeah? understand the world around us. Master of the universe. Show us your talents ready. Well done. <laughs> Math is so hard for me. When you work hard, you will achieve whatever you want to achieve. I was the only female out of over 100 students. I can be focused. 
focus and I'm willing to pay the price, I'll get it. That boy can fix anything. Yeah, Rosa, show us what you got. Do it, it's fun. Well done, Abby. It really shows what we can do when we work together to make a difference. Yes! yes. yes. Welcome to my better world. first will be very interested about it because it is centered towards them and we the teachers will like it because it is helping us to impart knowledge more simply and members of the community are already happy it was about my expectations so to say because I see a blend of reality with the animation. You know, there's this episode I felt really sorry for the character, even though I knew exactly that this was created. It was even drawn, actually. With the storyline comes emotion in the something. So I really like that. I saw very beautiful episodes, real life. And I think it relates well with our students. They have challenges. It gives them that need to be assertive in life and to hope for the future. I think it's, it's, it's been a great way of projecting um, what would no, normally be in a curriculum, in a book. Making it digital, making it visual really aids learning. So in terms of the My Better World program and what we're trying to impact, I think it's a, it's a powerful way of expressing it and connecting with, with students. My favorite is the way they, they live together with their friends. They were happy and they used to help their friends. I like the way they used to help their friends. Women and Girls Lead Global believes in the power of sharing stories. Sharing stories of courageous women who refuse to accept status quo. That's why we curate and screen powerful documentaries made by some of the world's best filmmakers in villages, cities, and rural classrooms. We start discussions that lead to measurable change. Women and Girls League Global provides safe places for people to be inspired by these stories and create solutions to problems in their own communities. We take a rallying cry and turn it into action. And we're just getting started. Women and Girls League Global puts documentaries to work for social change. Why? Because we know the power of storytelling, we know that her story is unstoppable. When 
ನನ್ನ ಹೆಸರು ಸೆಲ್ವಿ ನಾನು ಡ್ರೈವರ್ ಆಗಿ ವರ್ಕ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಾಯಿದ್ದೀನಿ ಅದರಲ್ಲೂ ಈಗ ಯಾರೇ ಬಂದರೂ ಕೂಡ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಫಿಮೇಲ್ ಡ್ರೈವರ್ ಅಂತ ಇದು ಮಾಡ್ತಾರಲ್ಲ ಸಖತ್ ಖುಷಿ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಜೊತೆ ಜೀವನ ಮಾಡಲೇಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ಅದು ಇಂಡಿಯಾದಲ್ಲಿ ರೂಲ್ಸ್ ಇದೆ ಅಂತ ಸುಳ್ಳು ಅಷ್ಟೇ Your voice is amazing. If you do this back up for Akin as well, yeah? You become the number 2 artist on the All right, that was inspirational. Victor, to you now. Thank you. Ready? working yes. okay so every year governments and development partners in invest billions of dollars in behavior change campaigns however systematic reviews often show that while they are very effective in, inc <coughs> in improving awareness and knowledge they rarely fail to promote behavior change, especially in the long term. So we need to find uh, alternatives. The question is, is edutainment one of those? By edutainment, I mean educational programs delivered through television, movies, radio, social media, and even games. However, the evidence base for edutainment is thin is based on qualitative studies or observational studies. So it's hard to recommend governments to scale up edutainment when the evidence is, is not there. Now, edutainment works in theory. The question is, does it work in practice? Can characters serve as role models? Can shows change the perception of social norms, what others do and approve of? Can popular shows improve feelings of collective efficacy? No one wants to be the first family to send their kids to school, the first family that stops female genital mutilation, because they often think that the community is supporting this. So uh, to meet the SDGs, we need to test and scale up innovations. Given the global challenges, these have to be uh, innovations that can reach scale at a low cost. And that's what the DIME Narrating Behavior Change, DIME NBC, is doing. We're working in the world Hollywood, the entertainment hubs of Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, Senegal, Nigeria, and India, that produce for large markets, but also produce for the respective regions, with traditional partners, with governments, with entertainment producers, and with celebrities. I'm going to show you that for the case of HIV, at least, we have very strong evidence that edutainment could be a very cost-effective strategy to combat this global epidemic. Um, you just saw uh, some clips of the MTV Sugar show. It showed that it's broadcasted in over 60 countries, has over 24 million YouTube views. And the season we're evaluating is the third season that lasted for three hours, that even though it focused on HIV messages, it had a small storyline around uh, violence against women. And we, we were testing both type of outcomes. We conducted a randomized controlled trial in Southwest Nigeria, while the treatment group watched Sugar. The control group watched another TV drama, but that lacked HIV messages. And well, uh, Abhijit Banerjee was one of the study's co-authors, so, you know, it's high-quality studies, like all dime studies, of course. Uh, eight to ten months after individuals watch these t TV dramas, we collected surveys to test their knowledge, their attitudes, their behaviors. But also, we collected objective measures for behavior change, measures for HIV testing, as well as we collected urine samples uh, to test for chlamydia, common sexually transmitted infection. The results were quite impressive. Uh, sugar viewers were more knowledgeable about HIV transmission. As a side note, we also find experimental evidence that their friends 
friends who were not invited to these community screenings became also knowledgeable about, more knowledgeable about HIV transmission, evidence of information spillovers. Um, viewers were also more favorable towards HIV positive people. V very, very good. What about behaviors? Well, we also find very strong effects on behaviors. Both female and male viewers were twice as likely to get tested for HIV. I'm talking about the objective measure, not self-reported measure for HIV testing. That's quite strong. Uh, for men, we see that half of them were uh, less likely to report sexual concurrency at follow-up, um, although they were also reporting much, they were doing this behavior much more often than women at baseline. Women were half as likely to test positive for chlamydia. So that's, that's quite a strong result there. Now, um, uh, th this short GBB storyline also had strong effects eight months later. Men were 20% less likely to justify forced sex or wife beating. With respect to behaviors related to uh, violence against women, when we directly asked the question, we found no effects. But this is very common with taboo or heavily stigmatized behaviors. So we indirectly asked the question through unmatched item count techniques. Both men and women were a third less likely to report sexual violence. And for women, we see a 50% decrease in reported physical violence. Also very strong results, in, especially if we, we take into account that uh, GBB was a small part of the third season we're evaluating. And a, a good argument for advocates of edutainment is that we see that effects uh, were larger for viewers who experienced greater program transportation, those who were transported uh, by the drama, that lived the drama. But also we see that effects were larger for those viewers who experienced greater character identification. They liked the character. They cried when the, the, the character cried. So that's quite quite good and, and a strong advantage that edutainment has in its narrative format over more traditional uh, approaches like flyers, books, that is hard to immerse in their dramas and to identify with their characters. So the question now is, is edutainment as effective in other settings with other formats uh, combined with more traditional campaigns supported by development partners and governments? And that's what we're currently uh, answering through the DIME NBC program in Northern Nigeria. We are carrying out social norm campaigns that in addition to showing um, screening edutainment, we are also packing the social norms component by having the community leader open and close these events, approving the new social norm that education, especially girl education, is in line with traditional values we have um, a, a female facilitator leading the, the events, leading the post-screening discussions as a strong female uh, role model. And we have 70 households present in each of these sessions. So uh, we're betting on that also improving collective efficacy, right? Several people are in the room, they're hearing the same messages from the, the, the community leader, from the screenings. Uh, I'm not gonna be the first one who send their kid to school. There's 70 of us in a similar situation, and hopefully this improves collective efficacy. Uh, in the same settings, we're studying the impacts of mobile games. Uh, you're seeing their feed the monster. Uh, these games are designed for low literacy populations with the goal to uh, teach kids how, how to read. Um, hopefully that's gonna be the case. If not, there are gonna be a lot of hours studying you know, with, with this game. In India, we are testing the effectiveness of edutainment, documentaries, uh, reality TV shows delivered through social media. Uh, uh, individuals with uh, Facebook accounts are, are invited to, to the study through Facebook ads. And then the intervention as well as the data collection um, are delivered through WhatsApp. And the goal there is to change attitudes and behaviors around uh, violence against women. Okay, so back to the MTV Sugar study. We saw some strong effects on knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. The question is, do benefits outweigh its costs? 
clearly pr the production costs uh, of a soap opera are, are higher than more traditional uh, approaches like billboards, flyers, or, or books. And now something we need to take into account is that generalized epidemics like HIV require targeting large segments of the population. And that's very expensive. So we're looking for scalable interventions. And entertainment media has the advantage that, yes, while its production costs can be quite high, their distribution or broadcast costs can be quite low, often approaching near zero for reaching uh, viewers. In the case of Suga, the cost to produce and the marketing for the first year are estimated around $2 million, but the distribution costs tend to be zero. They, they give away the, the rights um, of broadcasting. And as you saw, they've been, they broadcasted over 60 countries in, in private and public channels. Uh, they have 24 million YouTube viewers. Uh, so, you know, they reach the scale that lowers uh, distribution costs quite significantly. Significantly, we are doing a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, preliminary results show that this is quite cost-effective in the sense that we are estimating discounted wages of HIV-positive youth for working 30 years after they learned that after the show uh, encouraged them to get tested and they started treatment, and we're restricting this cost-benefit analysis to only five of the main markets in Africa of MTV Sugar, but again, it's broadcasted across the continent. And our results suggest that $1 invested in the soap opera has returns of $150. That's quite, quite good. Uh, or alternatively, 1% of the potential audience justifies this investment. Uh, we think we use very conservative assumptions. Um, for example, we assume that only 10% of individuals with access to television are benefiting. Uh, however, uh, the, the last season of Sugar was th the most watched, one of the most watched dramas in South Africa. Okay, so entertainment looks like a low cost tool to reduce risky sex. Should we scale it up? So let's start the uh, SmackDown. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. <laughs> I, like, I just highlight the 50% reduction in sexually transmitted disease. This is unheard of for any campaign on HIV prevention or any health behavior. So this is very dramatic. And a return of 15,000% on your investment? Well, I think we are generally happy when we get 10%. Um, so uh, as I said, I have a distinguished panel. I have a home camp the World Bank uh, representatives. We have Mohamed uh, Pate, who is our Senior Director for uh, Health, Nutrition and Population, also former Minister of State of Health for Nigeria. So I hope you like the results. Uh, Victor Orozco, of course, you just met him. He is the head of our behavioral change program in uh, DIME, um, specializing in randomized controlled trials, supporting the entertainment industry get answers uh, regarding the effectiveness of their interventions on the ground. Karen Brown, she is the senior director for the gender group and um, will hopefully add to the controversy. <laughs> Uh, Jeremy Hillman is the director from, uh, from uh, external and um, uh, communication. Yeah, external and corporate relations. Corporate relation, I messed that up. <laughs> you forgive me. <laughs> we always, we, I tried not to, not to use acronyms and then end up not knowing what the acronyms mean. <laughs> there we go. Uh, of course, f then we have from the entertainment industry, we are very we welcoming a distinguished panel of uh, collaborator, long-term collaborators and uh, um, from big media houses. Uh, at the far end, Georgia Arnold. She is the executive director of MTV Staying Alive Foundation uh, that sponsor, created and sponsored the MTV Sugar we just discussed. Eric Martin, um, senior strategist at ITVS. ITVS is a global leader in documentaries. We'll learn more about that. Uh, we have the pleasure to welcome one of the stars of MTV Sugar. Uh, Bukola Ola di Pupo, welcome. And uh, uh, last but not least, 
Arik Noboa. He is the president and executive producer of Impact Ed, formerly Discovery Learning Alliance. And so I'd like to, uh, we have a lot of panelists and a little bit of time, so I want you to be short but incisive and controversial. We hope to get a lot of uh, good discussions out of this. Uh, I want to start off uh, with Mohamed Pate. Uh, we have been, uh, Mohamed Pate is a good, an old friend. We started a very interesting collaboration way back then when he was Minister of State for Health. He is a staunch supporter of evidence-based policy and he showed it in practice uh, in many of his positions. So I'd like to ask you to tell us a, a, a little bit how your experience as a minister and now as a senior director for health, uh, how you see the challenges in reform processes in countries, the challenges confronting uh, policymakers with the demand for those health services with the social norms that prevail in many of our countries and how do we, how, what can we do to address them? How, please. Thank you. I, I think if you look at most of the wicked problems that we are trying to deal with in development, behavioral side is one of the obstacles that we tend not to attend to very much. The other elements of people going to get the services or how those who provide the services deliver those services. We tend to do a lot better in that. I'll give you an example. When I left the bank in 2008 and went back to Nigeria, I was in East Asian Pacific region, and one of the first issues we dealt with was the polio program. Polio is the single largest global public health program that is on the way to eradicate it after smallpox. And yet, Nigeria was the last place on the African continent where polio was stuck in the north. Lots of tools, lots of money, lots of vaccines, WHO, UNICEF, and the bank, and all of us. It became very evident that the behavioral element, not only the information and awareness, like uh, Victor mentioned, but really people changing their behavior to let their children be immunized, to accept. and it boiled down to two things. One is, do they trust the individuals or the institutions? Because the two dimensions of that, not only the individuals, but also the institutions. So finding those channels to convey the information that people can respond to. But secondly, in terms of modeling the behavior that they need to do, in 2008, we had a, I mean, edutainment. By then, I think our collaboration hadn't uh, developed that much used Majigi, which is a video, it's a locally produced uh, program that is edutainment based. In a particular place in, in Geza, we piloted it, which was intractable in terms of rejecting polio. Within six months, and these findings have been published, uh, it wasn't an RCT, but it was an observational study. 300% uh, increase in number of children immunized over a six month period, a thousand children more, a reduction in zero dose children and we broke through polio transmission in that geographical area <laughs> then partnered with 85 high risk local governments to replicate that and also with the Caniwood, which is another sort of part of this uh, ecosystem to broadly get the message out what am i saying i think it played a major a major role in nigeria's ability particularly in the north to change the behavior of parents to bring their children to be immunized. Nigeria is now polio free. But there's a lot more that we can do. The complex issues that we deal with in terms of fertility, desired fertility, that's something that is not just a technical element of the family planning. It goes beyond that, the norms, but also these cognitive processes that inform how people make decisions as to how many children they want to get. Maternal mortality, in terms of whether women go for antenatal care or go to deliver, because you have a disconnect. In many facilities, they go for antenatal care, but deliver at home. There are behavioral elements in there and how to deal with it. I don't think we've done enough in those directions. Nutrition, decisions around breastfeeding. So when I came back to the bank, as we began to think about the SDGs, the UHC, and improving health outcomes, it became evident to me that, in fact, we can do a lot more 
on the demand side, on really the behavioral side, uh, even as we deal with the constraints to people as reaching and getting the services and the behaviors of those who provide the services so that they are trusted. You go to DRC, Ebola is raging, at least it's improving now, but part of it is the trust issue. But how do you communicate for people to trust institutions and individuals where there may be legitimate reasons for them not to be trusted because of failed promises, because of corruption, whatever it is. And so that's a very um, uh, complex area, but I'm very glad that uh, DIME is sort of uh, getting into this direction, and I hope that we can sort of deepen it and um, study it more and put it in context, because a lot of it is very context-specific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Georgia, uh, you were at the you know, at the origin of uh, this effort. Uh, can you tell us a little more how the MTV Sugar idea was born? What were the challenges in pulling it together? And where are you today? And how are you using the evidence that is coming out of uh, these studies to, for the purpose of scaling up? Actually, when you talk about where it started from, what you, I've, I've just been slightly thrown because there's someone here called Francis. Francis, I can't remember your surname. Francis and I worked together 21 years ago, actually. He gave us, he was at the World Bank, and he gave me, I think it was $30,000 um, to do our very first documentary on with MTV Staying Alive when it was just a brand and not a foundation. So Francis, thank you. This is what we've become. It's <laughs> much appreciated. Um, so I, when Francis first gave us funding, I worked at MTV and we were a brand, but today we are an organization, we're a foundation which has the opportunity to use the MTV brand, um, and, but we are an independent 501c3. And the great thing about being able to use the MTV brand is everything we produce, including MTV Sugar, makes us culturally relevant in the markets that we're working in. And I think, therefore, young people don't see us as a behavior change campaign, they see us as a a TV drama or social media or a comic book, however they interact with us, that they love um, and they feel that it's their, their peers talking to them. And I think that's really important because what MTV Sugar, about, it, Sugar is about is it's here to create stories that save lives. Um, and I think that, you know, I, we can say that now because of the evaluation that Victor has done. But they are stories that are powered by the truth of young people's experiences. And I was once asked by a young girl in South Africa, whether or not in our new series we could include a storyline around um, someone dying. And so I asked her why, uh, how someone should die. Where, you know, was it because of AIDS? Was it through violence or drugs? And she looked at me and she said, I, d I don't care how they die. And I, she said, that's not my problem. You have to figure that out. And I was like, OK, fair enough. I am the producer. Fine. Um, I said, well, if you're not going to tell me how they die, can you tell me why they have to die? And she said, yes, because in our life, someone always dies. And MTV Sugar reflects our life. And so really, it's this, um, for us, we speak the words of our audience through drama. And that comes from formative research to um, production. Every head of department will have an intern, um, a young person who is paid and working for them. Uh, we do polling. So that what we have is this constant feedback loop so that we're able to really adjust our messages. It's hard with a TV drama. It's, it's a big ocean liner. Once it's produced, you can't change anything. But you can through digital and social media so we can make we can make sure we do that, but I think for our audience, it's really important that they feel valued, that they are seen, and that we respect them all the time. Um, the great thing about working with MTV is we get to use amazing talent. Um, so we have amazing, um, in you know, in Nigeria, we work with WizKid or Tiwa Savage. So if you know your Nigerian music, they are you know top of the charts, so that's brilliant. Um, and we also work with brilliant actors. The clip that you didn't see actually was um, Bacola plays a character called Fire. It, it's a two-minute piece on Far's storyline. So I'm going to do a quick plug. Um, if anyone wants to see uh, the new series of MTV Sugar Niger, we are doing a screening this evening. Um, so come up to me afterwards. I've got some tickets um, if anyone's interested at 6 o'clock. And I, the final thing I would say is that we are very diverse in terms of our storylines. So, um, and we're culturally relevant. So to go to your point, Dr. Pate. So it, for MTV Sugar Niger, we have storylines both set in Lagos,
Lagos and set in Kano and Kaduna. Our characters speak English and Pidgin and Igbo and Hausa. Um, we deal with child marriage um, in northern Nigeria, whereas we deal with relationships um, in Lagos. But also we're able to tackle different messages in different communities. So in South Africa, um, so we, we currently have um, or produced 10 campaigns to date um, in Kenya, in South Africa, and Nigeria, and we're just finishing Cote d'Ivoire and moving, and we're filming in India at the moment as well. Um, in India, we can tackle um, an LGBT storyline, and we have a young boy called Reggie who comes out and is gay. But that same series is aired in Nigeria and Uganda and Tanzania, where it's not legal to be gay. So in order to be able to show the same series with all, all of the messaging, we produce two versions. So in South Africa, we see Reggie's coming out story. But in um, the rest of Africa, what you'll see is Reggie's um, fight with his dad about being who he wants to be. His dad wants him to be academic. He wants to be creative. It's a little bit clunky, but it works because we have to respect the countries that we're in. But on YouTube and on video on demand, you don't have to respect because actually it's a global platform. So we put only put out Reggie's storyline where he's coming out. And what we've seen is that um, the first series where he came out, we got a lot of homophobic comments online which we started to moderate, but then our audience self-moderated. Um, but in the second series where Reggie gets a boyfriend, yay, um, <laughs> it was very exciting for us. Um, but when we put that, I was really concerned about what our audience would say. And actually, there were no homophobic comments. It, you know, two or three. And not because I think we have changed everybody's mind fundamentally that it's okay to be gay. But what I think is our audience, wherever they were watching, realized that Reggie is still gay. Reggie hasn't changed. So even though they may not like his sexuality, actually they just have to accept it. I know you asked me a whole load of other questions. I can't remember them. <laughs> no, this is great, great. Um, actually, um, I understand that MTV Sugar has a quarter billion social interactions. So just can't imagine the scale of what we are talking about. Uh, so we, we were thinking at the bank about a campaign to support our project investment. And, you know, yes, we don't come anywhere close <laughs> to quarter billion social interaction. So I'm going to pass it to Karen and ask Karen as a senior director for gender to think to tell us a little bit about how she sees the challenges of getting this type of work kind of incorporated into our own operations, incentivizing its use, and really kind of thinking very, very freely about how we can change the business of doing gender. Um, I really want to love edutainment, <laughs> and I She's think... She's against it. No, no, I, I think, I don't know whether I'm an enlightened skeptic or skeptically enlightened, so... Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, from the bank's perspective, and I think actually maybe Dime is going to change my mind, but from the bank's perspective, let me be really practical in terms of talking about challenges. The first is cost, uh, where our budget situation, which everybody knows we have, may not actually permit us doing it as part of our normal business. So we would have to look for other resources and other partnerships. Not insurmountable challenge, but something that we would absolutely have to work with. Uh, a second challenge is, uh, I think, about, and I, I actually think this is a real challenge, about lack of knowledge and know-how within the bank for how to do it. Um, we're supporting a lot of work. You are in DIME, we are through our gender innovation labs and the umbrella facility, but the results yet are kind of inconclusive. And I want to say maybe a few things about this. One is maybe we see some um, short-term effects, but we don't know how long-term and sustained those are. Um, I don't know that we know enough about whether edutainment, what kind of enabling environment is necessary for edutainment to have long-term effects, whether it's the legal and policy framework, whether it's um, the right type of service delivery that has to exist, those other kinds of things that I think are important um, to be thinking about. Um, I also think that um, uh, you know, in the practice, I'll give some examples. I reached out to my teams um, who are doing edutainment, and we still, as a group, I think, have a lot of 
they're not convinced it's our comparative advantage. We know how to deliver infrastructure. We know how to finance clients to build roads, and we know the engineering for the best hydroelectric dam. I don't think we know how to deliver entertainment and how to make it that way. And so the question is, when you're setting up an edutainment example, you know, we're investing in figuring out whether it's a structural driver, whether it's a social norm, uh, what would be the right media, what would be the right media channel mechanism, is it a soap opera, is it f soap opera with other things? Um, we don't necessarily know what are the key messages to target. So I think those, again, those challenges are not insurmountable, but I think to do this well, we have to have the right partnerships with the kind of colleagues who are sitting on this side of the table. So these are just some practical challenges I think that the bank should think about in an operational context. And I also think that, um, you know, uh, one thing we have to probably tease out, uh, and I haven't heard you say this yet, but um, sometimes edutainment can backfire, right? And I think we have to be thinking about that, and maybe that's one of the ethical issues we'll come to later. I think that's also a challenge we'll have to think about. Yeah, so let me follow up and ask you, do you worry about uh, giving the entertainment industry the right to change social norms around the world? <laughs> Uh, well, let me say that the, so the entertainment industry and many um, companies in different sectors already change social norms. So they're already doing this. Uh, the tobacco industry, the uh, alcohol industry. Uh, and some of these, I have to say, are pretty negative, so negative that actually UN Women um, actually partnered with companies like uh, like uh, Unilever to create the Unstereotype Alliance, which is to get the advertising industry to change the way it's delivering messages. So for instance, with respect to alcohol, or with respect to tobacco, the tobacco industry has really capitalized on gender norms to make smoking sexy for women. Uh, and we have seen an increase in tobacco, I'm not saying causation, uh, but there has been overall increases uh, going with advertising, making it cool and so forth, as we, you know, the independent woman with her cigarette. So they're already doing this. So, um, and, I, and so, the, you know, I think the question is how we work with the industry to actually change, first of all, the norms that they perpetuate that very are very harmful, certain gender norms, certain kinds of behaviors. Whether we subsidize them to do that is another question. I probably think that public money is not necessarily appropriate to subsidize um, industries, but I do think the right kind of partnerships, uh, like the Unstereotype Alliance, where companies can or you know, uh, can actually work to change norms using their own resources is a way to go. Thank you, Karen. All right, let me take it to Eric. Eric, as a senior strategist for ITBS. So we heard some of the challenges from this side. Obviously, we are not ready to do it ourselves. <laughs> we need to work with the industry, professionalizing the campaigns to a level that we could never aim to do ourselves, right? We are not, uh, we are not in the entertainment industry, but we are in the development business. And so what I'd like you to comment on is this tension that I'm sure you experience in your own, all of your businesses between what is commercially viable and big block, blockbusters as opposed to what is socially desirable and even products that may never be commercially viable, but they do have a role to play in uh, moving forward. Can you just tell us a little bit how the industry works and where do you find your space to do the type of work that you do? I'm thinking about all those challenges you just threw out there. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of them. But some of it comes back to this, I will get into the industry, some of it really comes back to the different ways that we see the world, right? The, the way that storytellers see the world and the way economists see the world. And so I think that's a little bit what we're teasing out here today, and even finding common language. I mean, storytellers don't tend to sit around talking about behavior change. Um, you know, we talk about inspiring viewers, we talk about connecting with audiences, we talk about whether people have... Um, you know, do they experience empathy? Do they love our characters? Do they want to know what happens to them? But the work is connected. And so I come here from the world of documentary film. 
So ITVS is the leading funder of documentary film for the public television system. We bring about 40 docs into the world every year working with independent filmmakers. And we are just part of this huge ecosystem. I think most of us know that this is kind of a golden age for television, and it's a golden age for documentary film as well. There are so many docs out there, and the documentary filmmaking world has gotten, they've gotten really good. Um, and the doc makers love to make films about all of the issues that you guys are working on in the room. Um, and so our, our approach from the get-go, having done this for over 25 years, was is there a way to use these stories that are already being told, these films that are already being made, uh, and this huge ecosystem of people who are out there spending years of their lives and thousands of their own dollars telling these incredible stories. Can we put those to work for development? So we did a experimental project with USAID um, where we worked with them for five years in five different countries, 37 documentary films um, that were already, they weren't films that were made for changing behavior. They were just great documentary films that happened to do with uh, gender issues, all sorts of gender issues. And for us, there were three really compelling reasons that came out for working with them. The first was that they kind of work. They don't work uniformly, and we're still figuring out. And in fact, Victor is going to be working with us to figure out a little bit about how they work. But, you know, for example, in Bangladesh, in the schools that we worked in, 300 schools that we showed the films in compared to the schools that we didn't, there were really significant drops in uh, child marriage and uh, girls drop out in a way that was not in the control schools. Now, we could only control for so much, which is part why Victor is going to get involved. Um, but those effects were seen in these other, in Peru, we were working on child education, in Jordan, we were working on um, uh, gender-based violence, and also in India, we were working on that. And the interesting thing was we could do it with the same group of films in many cases, because films that are about gender empowerment often have these effects that actually can work on gender-based violence, they can work on education, they can work on pregnancy, they can work on all these different things. The second thing that was really compelling to us is that it's super cost effective. These are films that have already been made, and so the costs are about reversioning, they're about getting the rights, they're about doing all these complicated things that you guys are talking about, figuring out the legal and the distribution, and the, but we, that's what we do. So that's our world. Um, and so incredibly cost effective in terms of getting $25 million worth of content from 37 films at a you know, one-tenth fraction of the cost. And the third thing is that you know, these docs aren't going to end up on billboards or action figures or um, uh, some of the places that a soap opera can get to, but they really do have a role to play in this panoply of, uh, of storytelling. First of all, there's certain audiences that really respond to nonfiction storytelling, but also they do have the ability to penetrate institutions in a way that a soap opera doesn't. And so for schools, for uh, governments, places that will be nervous about using um, some of this content in those contexts. This is much, these docs are much better, much stronger than the institutional content that's being used there. So in those three ways, we feel like just scratch the surface of what documentary filmmaking can do, and maybe we'll talk about it later, but there are things in the documentary film and production ecosystem that just need to be connected with the world of what you guys are doing in development that could actually be transformative and could scale into not just women and girls, but into all the issues that you guys are working on. Are you saying that we can have access to all the material and think creatively with you uh, how to reach populations that might not be reached today? Yeah, for a, for, for a very small investment. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get some quick reaction from the home camp of what we just heard from uh, the visiting camp. Any quick reaction? Um. I have, I do have a question, uh, which comes to this because I, th I think this is a question for us, um, and I haven't heard the answer yet. And I think the between all of you, you will be able to answer this question. Uh, so I understand it is sort of a there's a range of tools. You know, you have your documentaries, you have the soap operas, you have other, you know, the short videos, the animation thing. How much does it matter uh, between kind of one dose, for instance, you show it once? versus the repeated dosage in a show, soap opera, for instance, over time. And what do we know about what needs to be in place for the dosage effect, whatever it is, to be at least somewhat sustained over time? Any other reactions here? 
No. Um, any reaction from what they said or the question they just posed? I love the way none of the filmmakers rushed for their mics. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Karen, you're probably not speaking quite English for me. In, so I don't think we can answer the dosage question. I think I hand that back to Victor and the rest of you to answer that. I can tell you. Um, so I wouldn't call MTV Sugar a soap opera, by the way. It's a drama. Um, and we have series and we have our audience are out there. They get their YouTube notifications, so episode two is going out tonight on Terrestrial TV, and then on uh, Sunday, the first episode goes out on YouTube. I can tell you, um, MTV Sugar Kenya, which we produced 10 years ago, and was purely focused on HIV, so it was myth, stigma, condom use, and getting tested. That was all we could cover at the time. I know that um, is still being used today by PEPFAR's Dream, Pro Dream Projects across, Nigeria, uh, across Kenya. Now, actually, I don't think it should be. It needs to be updated, big plug, we need to go back to Kenya, um, but uh, it's still being used. The audience still love the music, even though that's a little bit out of date. They're still identifying with the storylines and they're still identifying with the characters. So even when you're doing a TV drama, it still feels like it's relevant today. The dosage and stuff, I think that's a whole nother evaluation to do and it's a really good question. I'd love to know the answer to that. Rihanna? Um. Just very quickly on the dosage, uh, we recently completed a, a meta-analysis of, of edutainment narratives aimed at reducing risky sex among youth. And there we see evidence of dosage effects uh, on knowledge. So longer series uh, show stronger improvements on knowledge. Um, and related to that point also about one show versus uh, uh, a show with several episodes. I'm just here paraphrasing uh, the words of my friend Reagan from uh, Impact Ed, an expert on edutainment and how it's produced. And it's basically when you want to introduce a very sensitive topic, you don't want to do it in a one in one show. You want a season where you, you build some connection, empathy with the characters, and then by episode 10th, you bring the heavy stuff, no? Uh, otherwise, there's the risk of, of backfiring. Thanks. No, wonderful. That's, yes. Just one quick thought, Karen. One of, the, one of the things I think, I think the question you're asking is actually a much bigger one, and that's answered really by formative research, in that there, there is no one size fits all. So, whole different solution, right, if we're trying to increase agricultural yields in rural areas through this tool, or we're trying to increase, you know, inoculations. I mean, so many different things we can do, but, but it, what's critical is the formative research so that we know, should it be a game show, should it be a WhatsApp video, should it be a series, a drama, a doc? Um, it, there's so many different tools in this toolkit, but I think we'd all on this side agree that this is a, a, a powerful, potentially a powerful tool in the SDG, in the development toolkit. And but as long as we see it as a development tool and not as kind of a, a cool comms thing sort of off to the side. Perfect, Eric, exactly. So but we are in the infancy of actually understanding the causal relationship between different type of programming and different interventions and their potential impact on the ground. And so we are starting, we, in fact, um, everybody came to one of our workshops in Mexico City where we started with a lot of different uh, media campaigns. Uh, we have a program. It's, it's still in its infancy in terms of the results are coming up, but of course we are looking forward to more and more results to kind of uh, really create an understanding of all these issues that you point to. And there is, you know, the sky is the limit. Um, the question is for Jeremy, for example, you know, how do you see as the head of external and corporate communications, <laughs> see, I'm a quick, a quick study. Um, you know, how do you see your own work as um, director, and of course, managing and leading a lot of social interactions for the bank? How do you see this? How do you incorporate this in the way the bank overall does business? Sure. Well, uh, so I've been asked to be provocative and throw a few hand grenades as well. So I, I, I will. But I'll, I'll start just by saying that I think uh, I see behaviour change and edutainment as having huge potential. And I'm a, I'm a massive admirer of, of Victor's work and, and, and the team. Uh, 
uh, and I've been following this for, 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 for quite a while now. Uh, I think it's a really important conversation to be having now as well because we're seeing so much changing technology and content and platform behavior and the way that uh, people are consuming, young people are consuming content. So it's a really important opportunity and challenge uh, right now. So I want to set out, if I can, a couple of what I think are big opportunities, but also a couple of sort of, uh, you know, I think what are quite serious challenges. And I also want to glimpse a little bit into the future of where we're going with uh, behaviour change and edutainment as well based on the technology because I think that's that's more the question than, than where we've come from. I think the first thing to say is, you know, this is not new uh, for the, some Brits in the room and I think George is one. Uh, everyone will be, uh, you know, uh, Brits will be familiar. There's, there's the longest running soap opera radio drama in the world is The Arch as it was set up first broadcast in the UK in 1951 uh, with the Ministry of Agriculture uh, aimed at farmers and smallholder farmers post sort of World War II to help sort of increase yields at times of rationing and food shortages. So uh, at that time there were no fantastic evaluations. I've got no idea how it worked out, but it's still going. <laughs> I've got a lot of fans. Uh, uh, but really, you know, honestly, there's been a much longer, we've touched on this and Karen's touched on this, there's been a much longer human history of how we shape behaviours, uh, you know, through storytelling even before there was mass media. Uh you know, we know that grabbing people's emotions and getting people involved in stories and personal stories is just incredibly powerful. So I think the question for me then is, is what's new now? What's happening now? What can we do with today's technology that sort of changes the game? And what's that? And that's the conversation. Uh, the two big opportunities, I think, are uh, and, and this is something we see a lot, you know, from our, our, our communications department, our communications work is the emergence of incredibly powerful tools and technologies to track uh, to track behaviours, to track individuals, the content they're consuming, the actions they're taking. Uh, increasing numbers of people just carrying, you know, smartphones in, in developing countries as well, with location tracking, with health information, with all of the rest of it. So we are clearly in a world where we're moving from just broadcasting messages and sending messages top down wherever they come from and hoping that people adjust their behavior to be able to see in real time how that behavior is being tracked. So that is an incredible opportunity to measure the impact, to test different messages and A and B test and, and lots of that sophisticated work and that's only going to increase as well. So potentially, you know, this could be a golden age for that sort of you know behavior change uh, work including using uh, using AI technology to see patterns uh, and to see uh, to see how we can make this work even more uh, impactful uh, the second I think big challenge stroke opportunity is is what we see is a shifting trust in the world and trust was already sort of mentioned here uh, what we're seeing is millions of young people around the world creating their own content, you know, whether it's on TikTok or YouTube or, or uh, on, on Facebook and other, other platforms and, and consuming that content. And what we see from all the global trust barometers and the global trust surveys is that people are increasingly not trusting big organizations or governments or big organizations, but they're trusting their friends or their people like me or their communities. So the challenge is how do we get those people that are the most influential people to reflect the sort of content we would like to see in in the content that they are creating in the videos they're creating and in, in what they're doing day to day because that's where the mass of consumption is going with all respect to mtv who are fantastic and doing great work more and more hours in the day and in the week are being devoted to that sort of that sort of content so those are two big opportunities and i think the the risks and the challenges are the flip side of those if you like so uh Clearly, as more and more of this content and this consumption moves to these types of platforms like Facebook and TikTok and Twitter, frankly, they're getting a reputation for behavior change, but not the sort of behavior change that we want to see. Uh, very different types of manipulation of behavior and uh, uh, and and uh, TikTok right now, for those that follow this in, in India, is becoming highly controversial. It's been used for a very positive education campaign, but actually, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, pretty disturbing content on TikTok and calls for a ban and calls for suspension. So we may be moving into a period where a lot of these platforms where this is being, uh, uh, the, you know, that are carrying this content are going to be highly regulated and managed. And there's a real suspicion and reputational risk for organizations like ours about who we partner with with these platforms. And, uh, and the whole ecosystem that they're creating of the way that this consumption is, uh, uh, is taken. And then the second sort of related but slightly different risk is that data and that privacy risk as well. That, uh, and, and all the countries that we're talking about, developing countries where we're 
Uh, even in developed countries, frankly, the protections are quite thin. And in developing countries, they're almost non-existent. How are we protecting that data that we're collecting from sort of illicit use, whether it's sort of in, you know insurance purposes or commercial gain, or can gays be targeted in certain countries because their acti activities they're taking on social online through content, we're identifying them. So. There's a huge number of factors for us to think about as we get more sophisticated. This may not be what's happening today, but it's what's right around the corner as we really get more sophisticated in our behavior change communications. Thank you, Jeremy. I actually want to take it to Bukola. So you talked about democratization of content, young people creating content. And of course, Bukola is our star of choice today. So we would like to hear a little bit about your experience. What do you feel uh, your responsibility is as an actor? What is the opportunity? And also I know little birdie told me your one of your, you know, very important focuses are is gender empowerment, fighting for women against violence against women. So we'd like to hear more about that. Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Bukala. I'm an actress. I hope I look the part. <laughs> <laughs> so I play the character Fa in MTV Sugar and my character goes through, she's raped and she goes through gender-based violence. Now one of the things that I believe when it comes to storytelling is that for people to be able to key into it, for people to be able to connect and relate to it, it has to be true. As an actor, you have to be true to your craft. So I've never been raped before, and I knew that I wanted people to relate to it. I knew I wanted it to be so real for me, because if it's real for me, then people, it will be real for people. So what I did was I went to the streets of Lagos. As soon as I got the story and I knew what the storyline was, I went to the street of Lagos. I spoke to a couple of people. Some didn't want to open up to me because some people find it hard to speak up after such awful incidents. But some did. And telling me their stories, they would cry, and you could see that they feel so hopeless. They feel like they, they, they're traumatized. They, feel so, they, they don't feel like they are anymore. And so I tapped into that emotion while I was filming that scene, and it shot filming the entire season. I tapped into that emotion, and even the rape scene I was shot, it was hard for me to come out of character. I kept crying, because the actor that played the part with me, that, raped, that was supposed to rape the character, was so good. He was so real, and it felt so real. And I, after they said cut, I was still crying. You know, it took me a while to come out, because it felt so real. And when the season came out, I had a lot of people come to meet me, because one thing is, a lot of people can differentiate your character from your real person. So a lot of people see me as far. So on the road, they will come and meet me, or in a restaurant, they will come and meet me, Bukola, or Fa, sorry, they don't know my real name, they just call my character name. <laughs> Fa, you really inspired me. You know, I feel I was raped before. I feel so, after watching, because she came out as a rape victim at the end of the season, she was able to, to muster, muster up the courage to tell her story. So other people will come meet me that I was able to tell my story. I went to meet my parents, I told them, I told someone, you know, and then I would give you an example of something massive that happened. So a couple of weeks ago, I was at a restaurant with some friends, and a girl walked up to me, and then she goes that she was raped last December. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, and all of that. I thought she wanted me to say something to her, but what she was telling me was that because of MTV Sugar, when, when she was watching MTV Sugar, it, wasn't, it was just purely entertainment. But because there are some information on that, you registered in your subconscious that obviously nobody's planning to be raped. But if it happens, you know what to do because it, it is registered in your subconscious. So she told me that when she was raped, the first thing she remembered was sugar. That's how she knew that the first thing she should do is go straight to the clinic, get the um, post-exposure prophylaxis, also have them take some swabs so they can get the person's semen and then she can take it to court. And that was exactly what she did. And she was able to put the victim in jail. And then she was thanking me and I was like, look, it's the entire MTV Staying Alive Foundation. That's the purpose of this foundation, to impact. And the numbers are great. I'm not surprised by the numbers because I read the storyline and I knew it was close to reality. It was close to my reality. So I knew that a lot of people are gonna get impacted from this. And being able to be a voice to people that can speak up, being able to tell their stories is very inspiring for me and it's an honor to inspire people. And thanks to MTV Staying Alive Foundation, they keep doing more because they've, they've been in Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa. It's the top rated show in Africa, I dare say. I know in Nigeria, I'm very sure in Nigeria is a top rated show, most viewed show, everybody loves it. If you hold an audition for a new season of MTV Sugar, 5,000 people will show up. And that's because they, be, they align with the goal 
they align with the message that MTV Stay in Alive Foundation is trying to pass across. Wow. <laughs> so uh, you elicited emotion from me and I'm sure from a number in the audience. Uh, what often we don't realize is how actors suffer through their characters and actually, yeah. right? Yes, um, yes. It's not just acting. Yeah, it's living through. So Victor. May I make a rec suggestion? Um, Bukola's fast yeah. uh, video didn't show up. Uh -huh. It's just two minutes. Could oh, we show is it? it? Is it ready? Show sure. Ready to go. Of course. Lights off. You just back up for AK as well. <laughs> yeah. You become the number two artist on the Billy Record label. <laughs> you know we don't have to have sex, right? You can just help me. Oh, out of the goodness of my heart, are For old times' sakes, baby. Didn't I do enough already? No. Or do you want to be the first face that people see when they open up the Play app? Huh? Fine. Me, for example, I do use condoms. But if I don't see me some time where I swallow some kind tablets for morning, I double protection them to call that one. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Brother, I thought we were here to discuss business. You know, so many girls would kill for this opportunity right here. Now, since the only thing I'm signing tonight is autograph, I'll give my lawyer the contract. Father, are you serious? Come on, man. I, I, I thought you'd be particularly grateful after you had your big moment. We've grown closer after that. So close that you're blackmailing me now, but are you serious? <laughs> Very soon, you go begin to hear some kind of stories about me. What kind of stories? I need to take a sample, please. I could lose my record deal, I probably will, but I couldn't let him get away with it. Get away with what? Did they, like, give you something to... Just exposure prophylaxis. It's a drug they just gave me. Stops me from getting infected with HIV. He raped me! This was supposed to be it, Khalil. This was supposed to be my big break. For me. For my family. Thank you. I'm actually happy it didn't come on <coughs> the first time around so that we could see it right now. So Victor, we all know this a lot of good intentions, but sometimes good intentions don't turn into good deeds. Karen said as much, right? So h how does research help us kind of progress in understanding what good intentions actually turn into good deeds? Um, so, <coughs> when you ask people working in a given sector if their interventions are working, they're always gonna say yes. It's like their baby interventions, right? Uh, but then when you have these randomized controlled trials, often you find um, much lower effects, uh, and often you also find unintended effects, no? And entertainment education is no exception. And, and maybe it could be open to more on, on unintended effects because a season has many more messages than one billboard, right? Um, and often people identify with the wrong character. They identify with a powerful, nasty bully, <laughs> uh, not with a, uh, the nice guy who gets A's no, at school. So, yes, we, we need to work with uh, professional storytellers, those who know how to reach the heart and mind, how to trigger all these social norms, etc. But we also have to be uh, investing a lot of time in formative re research, as Eric pointed out. Um, and of course, then carry out impact evaluations to, to see if they actually work, if they work in the right direction. And for the different populations, for b men, for women, for low income, low income, high low income individuals, if the direction of those effects are in the intended uh, effect. And, and there's several you know, examples in, in the edutainment literature, mostly from observational research that uh, you know, people were just 
uh, cheering for that mother-in-law that was in pro of child marriage, uh, wife beating. Uh, so that it's something, you know, we, we always have to be careful and research both formative as well as impact evaluation research is key. Uh, so whatever ends up being scaled up uh, actually works. Impact ed. Obviously, we want impact, right? So, Eric, you are our last speaker, so I'm going to give you a unique opportunity to show us our way forward. Oh gosh, all right. <laughs> um, so, how do you actually see the way forward? Uh, what, where do you see the opportunities? I know you have a large focus on gender and gender empowerment. Can you give us some examples of what we should be doing next and how we work together to move that forward? Um, th there's so much to, to unpack and, and that's so exciting about the different things that people have, have shared. Um, and, and Bukola, I think you articulated it so powerfully that one of the opportunities that we have with this kind of or these kinds of tools is to tap into human biology. Right? It was, it was, I think Jeremy made the point as well. The, the centers in the brain that deal with emotion and that deal with memory are linked. And so as humans, we are literally wired to remember information, retrieve information through story, right? If you ever talk to a memory expert and you're like, how do I like work a room and rem remember everybody's name? The first thing they're probably gonna tell you is tell a story and link all these people's names, right? So when we're tapping into that biology, we do have an enormous opportunity as well as an enormous uh, responsibility. Um, I think one of the things that, that I think of when, when we talk about this is this question, particularly because we're at the World Bank, I think about investment. Um, I think we don't, we don't want to wait for Disney or HBO or Vice Media to do great things and, and change the world necessarily, but we really need the people in this room, the, the weight and the power um, and the expertise and experience and the research and everything else of the World Bank to make these things happen because it looks easy. Like we show the clips and it's like, ooh, cool animated characters and amazing storylines. It looks really easy, but it's it's incredibly difficult. The, the research and the focus groups and the formative research that goes into them, if you do it right, is quite extensive. Um, but that's why we need to really co-create these with the development community, with development experts, um, so that we really can make the appropriate the appropriate change. Um, we need to work together, and, and I think um, you, you mentioned this about the sort of strategic partnerships. Um, uh, to, we're supposed to be controversial, so how about this? We know this is extremely powerful. Tobacco companies use it, and alcohol companies use it, and we should be using it even more. So what if 1% of all development funding went into media projects, specific, done right, of course, but specifically geared to achieving outcomes in alignment with the sustainable development goals? What a sea change and, and transformative opportunity that would be. And I don't mean like loans and those kind of big numbers, but just, just programmatic development dollars. What if 1% of that were going to this kind of powerful tool that was tapping into our human biology? I think that would be very, uh, very powerful. Um, other things that I think um, are, are important, marketing, we have to rethink how marketing works with things like this. There's a reason why it's MTV sugar and not PEPFAR sugar. Um, if I'm scrolling through a bunch of things on Netflix, I'm not going to be drawn to a show that's brought to you by the United States Social Security Administration, right? You want something cool, something that becomes part of, Georgia, as you said, like part of the cultural uh, conversation and really relevant. Um, so I think that's an important piece of it, that, that marketing and, and branding. I was in Cambodia recently, and I pray nobody in this room worked on it and I'm not disparaging it, it's great. But there were, you know, there were these posters about open defecation, these billboards, and it was like, you know, down here's like, don't defecate in the field. And it was like, brought to you by the American people and the Ministry of Health and the local Ministry of Health and the UN agencies, one, two, and three. And it was like, I, I, I get it, but that isn't necessarily the way forward when you're trying to create a piece of entertainment that you want young people to share on TikTok. 
um, you know, right, you have to kind of rethink those typical uh, development orientations. Another is, is distribution. Um, and, and Jeremy, you, you, you touched on this quite eloquently. Um, you can't sort of just make something and just think, oh, I, I made it, so people are going to just come. It's a great drama. It's a great documentary, so everyone's going to want to see it. To do this kind of work really well, it has to be very deliberate, very st strategic. Strategic. Yeah. So you don't you don't want to create a feature film. Is what you really need is a WhatsApp video, uh, and you don't necessarily want to do something that requires a mobile, you know, a, a smart TV and a great data plan if your audience is really watching free-to-air television. So all of these things have to be baked into the strong uh, uh, formative research grounding that, that, that any project has. So any project. So maybe I'll end with this. I think there's a great opportunity to stop doing one-off, one-off, one-off. So one of the things that, that Impact Ed is looking at is how do, we, how do we bring some of these things together and take the feature success and the talk show success and the animation series success we've had and pull those things together into sort of an, an overarching youth brand for Sub-Saharan Africa. We can get seed funding from development agencies to start something that then becomes a self-sustaining business model because we're creating something of value and people are watching, so there could be ad dollars or other sponsorship partnerships, kind of a, more of a PBS model perhaps, and then really get to big audiences with these big important things, but not have the research and the M&E and the audience aggregation and the talent development and all these things kind of happening piecemeal, but invest in a bigger way so they're economies of scale and all of the value that, that comes with that. So for us, we think that's a big opportunity, N not just for us, but I think for this whole industry um, to, to really create transformative change through media for social impact. I give a high five to that. <laughs> Definitely a great plan forward. Um, I'll ask actually, Eric, is it time for development Oscars? Yeah, let's do it. Let's <laughs> do it. <laughs> Award, uh, awards are good because they create um, the thing that you have to do for this thing to succeed, though, is you have to invest in talent. Um, and storytelling talent is, um, you know, we, you need to invest in in places that have a track record and doing this kind of work, but then you have to trust the talent, you have to trust the storytelling talent, and awards are good for talent. Talent likes awards. So having something like a development awards is a way to bring more talent to the field, a way to get more uh, attention to the field, and probably a way to create some momentum for this kind of shop that you're talking about, this bigger effort, this more systemic effort, this more scaled effort. Great. Yeah, I think about the Global Teacher Prize. And, and, you know, what a watershed moment for teachers that has been and the, the work that Varkey Foundation has done in that. And to do something like the Global Teacher Prize for this space would be quite remarkable. Yeah. So I'll go with, let's do it. Let's do it. Georgia, some last words. Yeah, so actually, I want to go back to what Jeremy said um, around risk. Um, so I think what when we look at lessons of scale, yes, we are huge because we give everything away, which Eric hates that we give everything away because it it's, doesn't help his business model. Sorry, but so we give everything away. So that's brilliant. But also we scale outwards. So we scale outwards in terms of our messaging. So we used to just be HIV, but we're now sexual reproductive health and rights. We're looking at TB. We're looking at mental health. So that's really important. Uh, we're scaling out in terms of regionally where we're working. And then the other thing we do is we scale down. So scaling down, we do peer-to-peer -peer education in schools. We work with the South African government, the Botswana government, the Soto government and governments when we talk about risk if we went into any of these countries and the first meeting we have is not with the government then we have huge risk on our hands especially with the mtv brand by the way and it's risky because i'm i've been given the trust of viacom viacom cbs uh, any day now um so i've been given their trust to use the brand properly and the governments trust us and that means we share scripts with them um in northern nigeria um, Bacola scene would not be seen. We have a, a half hour drama totally focused on the Northern Nigerian storylines, which passes the censorship board. So I think all of us know that we don't just rock up and we don't, and when we invest in talent, our script writing, our storyliners, they're all based locally, right? So we work local as well. And that I think helps with the risk.
Um, so yes, risk is something that we always have to bear in mind, but I think we're all experts. And so it's not about should the World Bank be doing this? No, you absolutely shouldn't. Should you be working with us to do it? Yes. And it's not, by the way, about finding millions of dollars to invest. It's about being one of a group of partners, because that, I think, helps spread the risk as well. Great. So we are approaching the end of our panel and our debate <laughs> well in time. I also want to give the uh, last word, if you have any, from this side. Sure. Uh, so like, as I said, I, I, I put some challenges out there. I think the answer is, uh, you know, to really do things transparently, to really encourage proper, you know, regulation, po proper sort of oversight, be out there working with these companies in a very open, transparent way about the approach, what we're doing and why we're trying to do it and what the outcomes we're trying to seek are. And I think it sounds like that's certainly been the approach that's been that's been taken. There is huge potential here as well, but I think we do need to realize as an organization, whether the World Bank Group brand is on it or not, that we are stepping into a minefield of uh, reputation and, and bad practices by lots of players in this world of content and behavior. Uh, there is benefit for us. We'd be, I think we'd be sensible because we don't have a choice not to get involved in it, but we've got to make sure that we are we're protecting ourselves and we're doing it in the right way. Um, so it's been a great conversation. I really appreciate the comments of Jeremy and you, George X. I think they're right on. I have to say, I, I worry a, a little bit, um, and this is where the partnership comes in for an institution like the bank. If you're doing a drama series or a soap opera that deals with gender-based violence, there's all kinds of potential neighbor negative repercussions. The bank has a role to play in ensuring that the services are available for survivors, that the justice system is working, that the police system is working. What can happen through series like this is re-traumatization of victims, and if you don't have certain building blocks in place, um, it's very difficult to be able to solve that kind of problem. So I think this kind of partnership um, about so the kind of solutions that have to be in place to very difficult challenges. And we all want to change um, the norms around gender-based violence. We want to make it not acceptable. We want to ensure prevention. And we don't actually know a lot about prevention yet, even with the work in the edutainment industry. But we can't do it unless we know that we have to have things in place. And I'm glad that you did. You said what you said in terms of, you know, you, you had some solutions. You need to go to the clinic. You need to get testing. But if the clinics don't have the proph prophylactics, if they don't have the pills, if you don't have a clinic in a rural area, um, that creates even more challenges. And so these are the kinds of ecosystems that we all have to work through together. And can I just quickly respond to that? Sure. I, I, I totally agree, Karen. And I think um, what we've done in, uh, Ni in Nigeria, in Lagos, so one of the things we also did working with the government was we went to the Ministry of Justice, we went to the police, and we looked at our service providers. So we worked with Hello Lagos. Um, we weave them into the storyline. We make sure that we direct enormously to them. Um, and the problem, by the way, in Nigeria is outside of Lagos, there is not an enormous amount of support. And so we question whether we should do it. But actually, the only way you shift norms is to be able to portray positive deviance um, and to be able to show that there is support out there, but you have to create demand for more. So I don't think we cannot do it because the services aren't there. The whole idea of this program was actually to complement a kind of supply side intervention of the bank with kind of the normative change on the demand side. And so together kind of work out solutions and kind of create also the awareness and demand. Sometimes, you know, people take, uh, you know, client satisfaction surveys from clinics, but the clients do not know what to expect. If we can change what they expect from the health providers, then the health providers will be held more accountable for providing quality services. Not everything is fixed just by demand and supply, but it goes a long way to changing what you know, what the results we can expect from these interventions. So I'm very much interested in finding way more opportunities to work on both sides of, of that uh, dilemma to kind of push reforms forward more forcefully. So I want to thank you all for a great debate. I would like to ask the audience to vote by their hand whether they are for or against <laughs> the use of entertainment media to push our way through normative change in developing countries. 
up for yes? Ooh. <laughs> uh, we'll, do, we'll do the up for now. <laughs> All right. A brave person. So next you'll be on explaining all the reasons why. <laughs> but until then, thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. It's okay.